That helps. I actually stood up my camp foamy <laughs> behind that camera to try to help kill the echo in the shop. And I can't open up the shop doors because my neighbor, bless his soul, such a good man, retired. Um, he's done it all. He's owned a huge logging outfit, so he mills, done all sorts of stuff, hand built all these old Model T cars from rust shells hand built them all the way up by himself and painted them i don't know how he learned how to do all that had a plane and uh he's retired he has he sold the mill down the road and he has uh he has a whole bunch of log equipment in the yard still <laughs> it's kind of funny i don't think those those hard working old boys they just can't stop and uh, he has his his skitters fired up right now I don't even know what he's doing. He's always doing something with his toys and his yard, his equipment. And uh, he's out there in the next pasture over doing something with it. I have a clue what. So I can't open up the shop door. Otherwise, the, the motor sound from his, you can probably hear it now, from his skitter. Anybody who's not familiar with a skitter, Google it up. It's a big chunk of equipment. So anyway, I could talk to that man for days. I love talking to our senior people of society. They know more, they're much wiser. And uh, they're usually filled with a, just a, a wealth of knowledge, right? Anyway, gonna get my voices heard. Sarah's still away. She's back east in New Brunswick, visiting the family. Uh, I had to sleep in today. I had to just beat the crap out of me. We had something really weird, weird sounds. In you know, the next lot over last night, kids woke me up. I'm out there in my underwear with a rifle, <laughs> walking around trying to figure out what it was. But the horses weren't freaking out, and that's how I gauge my, for me. If the horses aren't freaking out, I'm good. The horses didn't really seem to give a shit. I don't know what it was. Maybe some kind of weird bird. I don't know. I think we got a video. We recorded the sound, but whatever. So I went back to bed. But either way, like I ended up getting two and a half hours sleep, and then I was up at 4.30, and then I drove for an hour and a bit. And then I hiked a mountain, filmed the elk, found some elk, and then uh, came back. So I was beat. Had to sleep last night. Tried to sleep in this morning. Still hasn't rained. Still dry as dry. It's absolutely unbelievable. It stumped snow here a year ago, a year and a week ago. And right now, it's like we're living in Nevada. But anyway, 
I'm going to get some voices heard. And I'm going to be up again at 4.30 tomorrow morning. And a friend of mine and I, um, we're going to go really hunt down some monster elk tomorrow. And hopefully call some in and get some wicked video. That's what I'm doing tomorrow. Of course, I'll share it all. But in the meantime, here we go. Some more recent ones, all right? The emails are really piling in, it seems lately. It doesn't really come, it's steady, steady nonstop. There's emails coming in every single day. But they just don't stop. Oh, did he shut down his skitter? Sounds like it. Might be able to open up a shop door. <laughs> you know, if I do, he's gonna start it up again, right? Well, let's try this right now, anyway. Okay, listen to this, you guys. Young men having fun on a military base. Hi, Steve. I try to watch all your videos, but on occasion I miss one or two. Having said that, if you have read my prayer email to you, please disregard. Back in the early 80s, a friend and I used to sneak on the military base to hunt and target practice. <laughs> Did the same. There's a large wooded area outside of Battle Creek, Michigan, called Fort Custer. Okay, I'm gonna try to open up the shop. All right. Okay, let's see if he keeps it shut down. It's weird how that helps. That shop door really makes a difference with the echo. Now, sorry about that. One day, we decided to take my red bone coon hound into the woods on the base and let her run and use her nose. We got a couple hundred yards back into the woods towards a hollow that basically had a swamp in the bottom. As Lady, my red bone, ran down into the hollow, we heard what I can only describe as a loud scream and a howl. We also then heard footsteps, loud splashes, as if something was walking through the swamp at the bottom of the hollow. We both looked at each other in sheer terror. I asked, what the blank was that? Just as I asked that question, a lady came up hauling ass and blew right by us. Just a few weeks prior, the local newspaper, the Battle Creek Inquirer and News, ran an article of a state police trooper seeing Sasquatch while he was on patrol in the area. We did call the newspaper and told them what we experienced. They ran the article, and at the bottom of that article, they said what we experienced was a crane. And the splashing that we heard was nothing more than the tips of the bird's wings tipping the water as it flew away. We both read that article and thought, bullshit. A few weeks later, ironically, one of the major networks ran a Bigfoot special on TV. It had live recordings of the sounds that Bigfoot makes. We both went white as a sheet when we heard those sounds. Our girlfriends, who never believed us to begin with, made mention of our facial expressions when we heard those recordings on the television. I'm writing this to you a second time, just hoping to get your opinion. Would you think that we heard a crane back in the woods on that military base? Since then, there have been other reportings of people seeing Sasquatch back in those woods. Your thoughts, Steve? You can use my name. I'm 60 years old now, product of my grandfather's America, and I don't give a rat's backside what people think. Good for you, man. You're a free man. Randy, what do I think? Uh, you've heard me say it before. If you are, if you went out of your way to email us through me or me, you already know what it was. Just looking for a little confirmation, right? Um, that is exactly what your gut instinct tells you it was. And uh, there's no way that dog ran away from a heron. You know as well as I do. You know what you heard. So do tens of thousands of other people as well. They know what you heard too, right? Just keeps. Just keep slinging the truth, brother, <laughs> right? Just keep slinging the truth, no matter what. So I try to tell everybody, at least, as long as you tell your community, your neighbors, your friends, your families, what you know, even just once, then at least you did your part, right? And nobody can shit on you later on for not informing them for when or if they get slapped in the face with this shit, right? Just keep slinging the truth. Everybody. I better get back down the list. I think I did recents yesterday, didn't I? All right, let's go uh, 700 and something messages down to the bottom.
Many, many puzzle pieces. Okay, hold on a minute. I oh, forgot that one. My story. Token helicopter outside. I should really enjoy your platform to inform the people. I also enjoy proper grammar and punctuation. Ha <laughs> ha. Condolences to the loss of your pal, Mr. Macaroni. A loss I'm familiar with. I had, I had had many great four-legged pals, and most are better than humans. I don't mind sharing my name and story, and this is a long one. I hesitate to share it any longer face-to-face -face because of a lifetime of ridicule each time something odd happened. So, or as you say, all right, here we go. First, a little about me. 57, this January 2022. I was an avid outdoorsman, a lifetime fisherman, canoeing, hiking, and exploring. All right, that helicopter can suck it. Hold on a minute. <clears throat> All right. A lifetime fisherman, canoeing, hiking, and exploring. You can keep me out of the woods. I began hunting at the age 17 when I moved out of my parents' home. A 16-gauge Mossberg shotgun was gifted me by my pal and it was cheaper to buy a box of shells and hunt for my meat than to buy it at the store. Over the years, I became well familiar with the animals and sounds in my region. All right, on to the list of oddities I have experienced, starting with the earliest memory of something that struck me as unusual. Please note, these are not in chronological order. Number one, the light. At age six or seven, I was looking into the nighttime sky in a cold January night in Toby Farms, Delaware County, PA. I saw a glowing green ball of I saw, I saw a glowing green ball at the height of the atmosphere. It was small, bright, and sharp, not fuzzy. It went from point A to point B and stopped, then it disappeared. It took about four seconds total. The night was perfectly clear, and airplane traffic back then was not what it is today. Mom said I was imagining things. That was her usual reply to my inquiries about something I saw or heard. I never forgot this night. Something always st stuck with me about it. Number two, the house. In 1972, we moved to the college town of Swarthmore, PA, into a big old home that was previously owned by some folks I thought were rather odd. Things in the house left behind included items and marks that lent, lent me to believe they were involved in occult practices. That's creepy. The basement was dark and damp and had an aboding feeling. I never liked going down there. The third floor was cold and had an empty, scary feeling. I hated going up there, even when I had to use the only other toilet in the house of seven people. I'm getting a sick, a sick feeling as I write and I remember this all. A. On many occasions I saw a black cat turn the corner going from one room to another. My siblings also saw it many times. B. One night my mother yelled at me, what the hell did you let into the house? I was bringing things home like amphibians and reptiles, so it was a reasonable question. However. When I asked her what she saw, she replied, a large, unkept, mangy-looking cat. I said nothing as I didn't know what she was talking about. C. One winter night as we got in the den, as we sat in the den watching the TV with the fireplace going and doors closed, we saw the black cat go around the corner from the den towards the kitchen. I jumped up, went to see where it was, and again, nothing was there. We had many cats, none were black. This was ongoing curiosity and somewhat entertaining to us all. We were lacking the knowledge that spirits can appear in animal form. Our entertainment with this with its presence was a welcome to it and led to other mischievous events. I can't adequately express the hate I had for the basement and the third floor. I often felt the house was looking at me when I was outside working in the yard or hanging out in the park across the street. I have to emphasize that I felt I feel sick writing this as I remember as I'm remembering this crap. D. On occasion, I heard my younger brother, who slept on the third floor, yelling at someone to get the hell out of his life. I went up to see if he was okay, and he was in tears. And the room is as cold and felt very wrong. He refused then and to this day to discuss what happened. E. One of my younger sisters was haunted by nightmares, where our recent, recently deceased grandmother was in her room bothering her. This sister was only seven or eight years old, no mind for the twisted or macabre. She was an innocent child, so what the F? F. One day in particular, I came home from a day out misbehaving with my pals, and as I laid on my 
bed to relax, there was a lot of noise coming from my brother's room on the third floor. Furniture dragging, banging, etc. And it was loud. I yelled out through my ceiling that he'd, been, that he'd best stop or I was coming up there to kick his ass. Well, it didn't stop. My threat was met with an increase of intensity. Really? What the F? My brother would have stopped, trust me. Well, I jumped up and ran up the stairs to the third floor and no one was there. It was ice cold. I felt my life was in danger, so I ran as fast as I could out of the house and looked back. The house is watching me. Ugh. Gee, one day I, was, I had two friends over. We were just hanging out. My older sister came into the room to talk to one of my pals who she thought was cute. Somehow the talk of our house being haunted came up. I did not encourage it. My pal yelled at the top of his voice, I don't believe in you. This is a bunch of bullshit. He then started laughing and dared it to show itself real. I scolded him, you're an idiot, and I ran out of the house again. He quickly followed, as did my other pal, saying it got very cold and they didn't want to be in my house anymore. Now, these accounts are not about my experience in the woods just yet, but I'm building the history of the odd and unusual things I've experienced that I can't talk about without being ridiculed or put in a madhouse, okay? Or, all right. Number three, the creek. A, one day as a young teen, I was fishing with a pal down at the local creek as I did often. I spent more time there than anywhere else. We came to a bend in the creek. We hadn't fished before and a horrible odor of rotting flesh filled the air. We searched for the source thinking a deer might have been hit by a car and died. Maybe a buck and we could harvest the rock, the rack, we found nothing. The odor went in and out, but was so overwhelming and nauseating, we decided to leave. I had a feeling more like ought to leave and quickly. B. There's a section of the creek we never fished upstream of our usual area. Odd as it was, because we fished over two miles of that creek regularly, but never there. It was always a curiosity to me, and several times I attempted to discover the creek in this area. It was surrounded by the heaviest brush in the area, perhaps 30 or 50 yards on each side. They were almost impenetrable, although we could, although we could and did skate through this area in the wintertime without thought or a feeling of having or needing to leave. Anytime I ventured into this area, I felt like I was being watched and was in immediate danger. I would leave promptly upon receiving this feeling. One time as I approached the area from the other side, I had an overwhelming feeling that I could, that I would watch that I would catch nothing and my time would be wasted here. That is odd. I felt disappointed and left to fish elsewhere. Really. I was an explorer. Try to keep me out. Other times as I fished my way up the creek towards this area, I would suddenly feel that I shouldn't go any further. A lot of gentle mental suggestions to keep out. I always unknowingly heeded the warning. Number four, cryptids I have encountered. A. One day while trout fishing in my favorite stocked trout stream, the same stream I've been fishing for 27 plus years at the time, I was drifting the bend with a BB sized split shot and a size 12 egg hook with wax worms on a nice fishing rod with two pound line. This is one of my favorite things to do. The sun was setting and I caught, I caught a of what I thought was a big black dog sitting in the bushes about 60 feet from me on the other side of the stream called out to it and it looked at me. Its eyes were greenish yellow and it had pointed ears and long whiskers. I did mention that we had plenty of cats growing up. This was a 70 plus pound black cat. What? I reported the sighting to a local game warden and was sum summarily dismissed. I didn't speak of it for some months. I had a fishing pal who was always there with me, not this day. I thought to tell him one day, and he said he saw the cat as well. That's cryptid number one. B. One day while sitting at a traffic light in a heavily populated area, I was looking across the road watching a police officer issue a ticket. While I was focused on him about six yards away, there was a movement in a bush on the side of the road behind his vehicle on the other side of the small bridge that went over a small creek. I was curious enough to keep watching as a dog-like creature that also looked like a mini kangaroo with a very odd shaped muzzle and black and white striped rear legs came up from the creek. The light changed and I wanted to go across the highway rather than turn left to go home so I could pull over to look for this thing. It looked like something you wouldn't want to corner. I decided to turn and go home because who would believe me? 
Not to mention, had I pulled up behind this officer and gotten out of my car, he may have felt threatened. And this particular TWP has a police force known for a no BS Nazi style of dealing with the public. So yeah, on my way home. C, camping. As a family back in the 70s, we used to take advantage of all the time, share opportunities that came before us. Dad would respond to the ads for free weekends and we went a lot. He and mom would endure the sales pitches and the kids would go play. <laughs> I'd find a pond or a lake to catch fish and salamanders and anything I could. I loved the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania. Been there too. Back then it was a gorgeous and it was gorgeous and largely unbuilt, unlike the tourist traps become today. Well, my parents did eventually end up buying into two properties up there. One was Shawnee Resort on the Delaware River. The other was a small cabin on a lake in the development known as Wild Acres. Wild Acres was unique as it was quiet and had a huge parcel of land on the other side of the lake from our cabin. There were about seven cabins slash homes on our side. I loved fishing there in the surrounding lakes. One day while while we sorry, one day we were there, my brother and one of my younger sisters decided they were going to canoe across the lake and camp for the night. As they were setting up camp, they heard a lot of movement in the brush and small trees just outside of view. It was dense forest then. They thought nothing of it. Why would they? The canoe was right there and they could run if it was a bear. Towards evening, as they're settling in, they heard voices talking back and forth, three distinct beings and locations surrounding them. They also heard a wood knock. My brother knew that bears, deer, and elk made no such noises like they were hearing and he called out to see if they would get a response. He did, a growl. A low, long growl that convinced him to leave. They both felt threatened and hustled back, leaving some of the gear behind. What the hell? D, a youth retreat. Age 14, 15, I attended a youth group at a not-so-nearby church. I loved it. It was one of the few good influences in my life since my grandpa passed away. While they planned a retreat in the Pocono Mountains on a farm, I couldn't wait to go. Go I did. I love the opportunity to get away, even if in the middle of January. It was cold as can be, and we all stayed inside by the fire talking and doing retreat activities. I felt a bit dizzy after a while and wandered off to bed alone. I laid on the top bunk, staring out the window in a quiet daze. I felt like something was beckoning me to come outside, and I felt I could no longer stay inside of the group. But my, I put on my jacket and gloves, on and out I went. I walked down the sidewalk towards the barn. I had no idea where I was or where I was going. I felt almost led to just walk and keep walking. After it seemed like a short bit, I got scared and wanted to go somewhere safe. I did not feel safe. I saw a light bulb in the entry to the horse stables and started walking towards it. I stopped about 50 feet from it and found I couldn't go there. I couldn't move my feet. I was numb with confusion and fear. I prayed, Father, please send someone who loves me to find me. Moments later, a young man whom I admired for his love for Jesus come down the path I was on calling to me. He asked what I was doing and if I heard them calling to me. I mumbled, I don't know, I don't recall hearing them. He took me inside and I felt the need to get out. Something was very wrong. They didn't leave my side. I later found out that they had been looking for me for about one hour. My girlfriend said that I looked hypnotized before I left and she had pinched my face hard. I didn't react. What the F? I don't know if this counts as encrypted, but it came to mind as I'm typing. E, 7th grade, camp out. In 7th grade, my class was offered the opportunity to come on a farm in Lancaster, PA. I went, of course. Lots of great memories from that trip. The best of which was feeling sorry for the billy goat Mike, who really liked me. It was pouring rain one day and we were heading out to go to town. I felt bad for Mike and let him into our cabin. Wait, what? Oh, so it was an actual billy goat. <laughs> so it was a billy goat named Mike. Usually people around here when you call him a billy goat, music and run up and down the mountains good. I felt bad for Mike and let him into our cabin. Ha ha ha. Mike ate holes in everything and enjoyed our food as well. Well, anyway, the mayhem and wrath looking to be unleashed by the teachers was quite the sight. 
I never admitted letting him inside. It was great for me as a kid. Ha <laughs> ha. Later that week, the night before we were to leave, two of the teachers told me about something that happened in the woods the last time they were there. They were speaking about loud noise in the woods that included smashing and tree shaking. I called bullshit and said, take me there. Well, it was one teacher and me. I suspected the other was hiding off somewhere, ready to try to scare me. We walked through the woods for about a quarter mile and nothing, not even howls or crickets. Hmm. As we left the woods and made way back to the road, a nearby tree began to shake violently. He tried to convince me to leave it be, but I wanted to know. I ran towards the tree and started yelling at it, thinking it was the other teacher. No response. I turned to walk back and shook again. I got angry and had a temper, so I picked up rocks and started hurling them handfuls of street, of street stones at the tree. Nothing. I suddenly felt an eerie feeling that we should get. We did. We went back to the farm and guess who was there? The other teacher. Okay. This is the one that just eats me up. At first it was a curiosity and I was glad it happened. Excited even, but not now. It was an assault. F. F is for F me, Sasquatch or Skinwalker. I believe the year was 1990. My best pal and fishing buddy of 17 years and I made a tradition of going north to Lake Wallenpolpak every opening day of trout season. We made, a great, we made great memories together. I'm actually taking a break from typing this as it's mentally exhausting. On the way to our destination, we always took the same route. There was a repair work being done and there were signs everywhere of a detour ahead. We were adventurous and said, Bah! We can figure our way. And I took the next exit off RTE 380. Both of us had been in new home construction for almost two decades and we both had great sense of direction. No worries. I pulled up the main highway and we found ourselves in what can only be described as a small 1.5 lane road cut into a mountainside. To our left was a 60 degree incline and the same to our... Okay, hold on a minute. To our left was a 60 degree incline and to the same and the same to our left going down. It was heavily wooded, thick and impenetrable by our observation. I drove slowly about 50 miles an hour and it was early spring and we were going through heavy fog banks as we went up and down and along this winding road. After 30 minutes, we decided to pull over and check our map. We always had maps back then to find new fishing holes. We met at the back of my pickup and opened the map on the front of my boat, which we bought, brought along for the first time. We located our exit point from the highway and began discussing the time passed since, since and how far we estimated ourselves to have traveled and what road we might be on. As we were talking, quite relaxed, confident, and enjoying ourselves, we heard what can only be described as a bulldozer smashing through the trees and brush towards us. It was late at night and very silent, except for us and that whatever it was. The cracking of branches, and I suspect trunks, was loud. These were not small sticks or twigs being broken, but large pieces of lumber. It stopped. I thought, moose, elk, not a bear. We dismissed it with an acknowledgement of, wow, that was something, and continued talking. I estimate, estimate it was about 75 to 100 yards away. That's really close, actually. We went back to the map for a moment when it happened again. Now about 50 yards away, tops. I said to my pal, if you hear that again, you better be in the truck because I'm getting the hell out of here. No sooner, sooner did I finish saying that when it came at us again at about 20 yards and let out the most god-awful, horrible, threatening bellow of a scream that I can only hope to describe. It started out lower than any animal could have and louder than any animal could have. We felt it in our bodies and the windows on my truck rattled. That's freaking amazing. And that is basically the same description time and time again. I don't want to experience that. It went on long and loud with a rising pitch and finishing off to what I can only call a woman being torn to pieces, said basically every other person who experienced that. Louder and longer than humanly possible. Longer and louder than anyone could ever believe. The message was clear. Get off my mountain. Next thing I knew, we were driving away saying, what the hell was that? My buddy, who was a smoker and a drinker, he did plenty of both that night. The next morning at the local bait shop, I asked if anyone had ever encountered or been told of such a thing. 
I thought, surely these fellows live here, they know. I was met with chuckles and ignored. Really. We enjoyed our trip and did well catching many nice fish, as we always did. After returning home, I began to tell people I knew who knew me well enough and who were also outdoorsmen, and they all called BS. You heard a bear, you heard a bobcat, etc., and so on. I kept quiet after this and only told, told it at, at family gatherings as a story to entertain, expecting nothing. Now I don't even do that. I know what's out there. We live in a matrix, a society created by they who desire to control our thinking and our lives. I'm in the city now, I don't go to the mountains anymore. I see the matrix and I'm doing what I can to open the eyes of those I love. Thanks for your platform, Steve. Never give up the podium. I've included a picture from Google Maps of the area where this thing assaulted us verbally and emotionally. I enjoy your opening videos and music and all the wilderness you share. I was meant to be a mountain man, but I married a city gal. <laughs> The woman of my dreams. She keeps me on my feet. On, she keeps my feet on solid ground and makes me want to be a better man. You live in the dream, brother. Take it easy and keep the beasts off your property. Michael Nino, Upper Darby, PA. Scranton. I remember driving through Scranton. Well, there's the map. Anyway, guys. Many will be familiar with that area. Many won't. Kind of funny. I don't really think about it too much, but I sure I've been to a lot of places in the States. When people write in and tell me where they were, and I'm like, oh, I've been there, I've been there, I've been there. But kind of funny. That's a handful of shits going on in a lifetime, man. Um, you know the stuff that went on in the, in the beginning of the story, the stuff that... Me, personally, I'm just not into it. I'm not into it because I don't want nothing to do with that shit. I'm not familiar with it, I don't have it in my life, and I don't want it in my life. And uh, so I don't have any input for that sort of thing going on inside of a home. I just don't. I don't look into it. And I don't have many people who talk to me about it. So, you put the scream rattling your body in your windows of your truck. That is something else, right? How many people have experienced that? Too many. Too many. Mm-mm-mm. All right, before I start babbling, let's get on more here. I'm glad you wrote that in, it was lengthy. Um, I wonder if somebody can relate to the areas and what you experienced and write in. The big cat thing, I think that's one of the first here with that description. We've got a lot of, the obviously the Panthers have been spotted all over the damn place, but. Holy shit. All right, what do we got here? Having a clue. The title even says not sure. <laughs> now the title says red. Not sure. Title is email. Hi, Steve. I'm very glad someone has taken a stand. You can use my first name if you wish. My experiences do not necessarily prove anything, but nonetheless, they are mine. Where I am located, it's very rare you hear of anything out of the ordinary. I find it interesting that these beings are like us and trying to protect themselves from us. Some are very dangerous and some are friendly. I've never seen one, but I've had experiences I can't explain. I've grown up in the country and love the woods. To this day, I continue to desire the serenity of nature. Back in the 80s, my father took it upon himself to build a house on his homeland. Between him and I, we built our houses and finally moved in. It was located about a mile off road and surrounded by neighbors with several other acres of wooded land in Southwest Ohio. Between the stories of my grandma, of ghosts and things she saw in the valley and the apparent settling of people in the area before us, we were intrigued. This is definitely a story before us. But when we built, it seems we disturbed the land and some things that were there. In short, we have experienced quite a bit, but more than one experience makes us look further. Something we cannot seem to explain is some sounds at certain times. When we moved, I had a dog, part shepherd, part Labrador. She was not afraid of anything when it came to the family. Actually, unpredictable, but really protective. She was my buddy and protector. We had just moved in, and we had, we had placed her house at the bottom of the hill, which seemed to be, in very, com which seemed to be very comfortable with. She, sorry, you guys. Which she seemed to be very comfortable with. One evening, I went down to feed and water her and make sure she was doing okay, and she would not come out of her house. This is strange because she was very dominant. 
I pitched a water and then a sound came to me from the weeds. It sounded like someone blowing across the top of a bottle. I talked to her and acted like it was normal. Then the sound on the other side of the area, about 30 feet away. Then, then she would not come out of her house and another sound about 30 feet away on the opposite side. I stepped back and before I knew it, the sounds were all around me and my dog was whimpering in her house. I put a leash on her and ran all the way up to my house. This is after early dark. The sounds were like someone blowing across the top of a pop bottle. This is strange, and I really felt that something was acknowledging us. I was wondering if anyone else had heard these sounds. Keep up the good work and best wishes to you and yours. With great respect, Kevin. Okay, Kevin, thanks, man. Yeah, they're kind of creepy, right? It's the animal, it's the animal, the animal reactions is what will get to me. I use dogs and horses are my two go-tos. If the horses are shitting themselves, something's up and you better pay attention to them. Well, obviously with the dogs too, right? The dogs know way more than we will ever know. Unfortunately, but listen to your dogs. All right. Well, this is a, holy cow, this isn't a book. This is a Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> All right, we're going to have to use that, hopefully on an opener. I'll mark that as number one. That puts it to the top of the list so I can hit it tomorrow. All right, this one's not so bad. What's this one? This is titled Wood Knocks. It's now titled Red. Mr. Rizal, this happened to me and my youngest son yesterday, November 13th, 21. We were hunting deer up Marble Creek in northern Idaho. It was located about 30 miles up the St. Joe River from St. Mary's, Idaho. My family and I have been hunting there for over 30 years. I can't think of a way this could potentially assist someone in their quest to add credible information to their puzzle. However, here it is. I'm 69 years old. My son's 50. We've been in the woods our whole lives. We do not possess any exceptional woodsman or hunting skills. We will not say definitively we can identify everything we have encountered in the woods as we pursue our hobby of hunting and related pursuits. Neither of us have an education that would be considered elevated in any way, shape, or form. The encounter. Morning hunt. I was on the stand above a large field. My son above me hunting a large patch of alders and pine for larger than average buck. I observed one doe and he three. Neither of us cared to harvest the specimens that we encountered. As we met back at the vehicle to talk about the morning hunt and eat lunch, we failed to say what he failed to say what he heard all morning. That'll become relevant later in this account. We made plans for the evening hunt and agreed to exit the woods just as it was getting dark. I'd set up in a ground blind and a semi-flat bench 100 yards above the road we accessed to get to the location. He was going to hunt a V-shaped bowl above me. About three hours after I set up in the stand, I heard a loud crack above me. The field of view was about 25 to 50 yards, depending on the direction I was facing. Then I heard two more loud cracks from the same direction. Just a few seconds later, I heard a crack from a longer distance behind me. The vehicle was slowing. A vehicle was slowly working its way down the road below me, and it was silent while the vehicle passed. As soon as the vehicle passed, I heard two more loud cracks closer to my location. Now, I was becoming very focused on what was going on around me. The last two cracks were as loud as a pistol shots, but definitely would, either breaking or being struck against something. Then from above me to my right and behind me, two, one, then two loud cracks, and these were close enough to make me pick up my rifle and start scanning the woods around me with more than just a hunter's anticipation of a potential shot at an animal. My mind was running a list of things that could produce the sounds I was experiencing. I didn't feel any threat or fear. However, I was as ready as I could be if something showed up that wasn't friendly. The quiet was odd. I then heard four heavy steps from the direction I was looking and to the right, which was pretty thick. With a 30-foot field of view, my son, at least at this time, I thought, was a, was a skeptic of Bigfoot. So I started to wonder if he was the cause of the ruckus going on. Immediately the thought come 
there is no way he could move the distances to, pro to produce the sounds I was hearing and the volume I was hearing them. We hunt in full camo, matched to the timber, and greenery we hunt in. Yet I was aware that whatever was causing this knew where I was. These events continued for another hour, always in patterns. The cracks would occur one, two, one, or two, one, two patterns, with one three count and one four count event happening only once. The footsteps would be three to five steps and then silence. I had trouble understanding how they could sound as heavy as they did. It was almost dark now and I could make something coming my way from just below me. I couldn't see a dim, I could see a dim light every now and then and my son finally came into view. I asked him if he heard all the cracking and stomping. He made the comment that the loud cracks had followed him all during the morning hunt. He told me that they had entered, he told me that he had entertained the thought that I might be the cause of all the noise going on to joking with him. Sorry, I'm reading a little off this morning. I don't know why. Then he arrived at the same conclusion I did. I could not have covered the distances or had the physical capabilities to perform the noises he was hearing. He did say he did not hear any footsteps. While we were talking, the cracking seemed to be coming from at least three directions around us. And this is where he drops the bomb on me. He told me, last year down the road where it bends, not 300 yards from where we parked the vehicle, he observed a man climbing the opposite ridge faster than what he thought would be possible for someone to accomplish. He said it looked like a man wearing a poncho with the hood up. He was swinging his arms from side to side as he progressed up the ridge. The road progresses around the corner and has a turnout at the top of this ridge. My son was on his four-wheeler, so he quickly covered the half mile to the turnout and discovered there was no vehicles parked there. If it was a hunter, no one was around. Then he tells me, Dad, I've been on that ridge and I had to sling my rifle on my back and use both my hands to climb up to the road. My conclusion is that Bigfoot does exist. These are the details I'm able to relate. I apologize for the length of this account. I'm an ex-police officer. I hope this is enough detail. To answer any questions you would have, you can use our names as we really don't give a fly and poke it. A rolling you can use our names as we really don't give a flying poke, a rolling donut. What anyone else thinks. <laughs> Rusty and Josh Wadsworth. Wow. And there you go. Two more members of the club of no return. Email us. Through me. Uh, so many people. I wonder how many people. Well, I wonder how many people wrote in here to us for the first time ever. I'm getting close to have to touch bases with a few scientist friends here pretty quick. I might email them this evening and see how far along I am and how I'm going to start to deliver information to you guys, knowledge that they've acquired, which I'm going to. And um, see if it's time to so I get that ball rolling. All I haven't even been, I have not been saving any information in one place. Um, they are the information is all in very safe places, but I have not saved them on any of my devices and put them in one place and organize them yet. But would take won't take too long. Um, just have to make sure it's all going to make sense as it's delivered and uh, carry on that way. And I have some other questions for some other scientists. Unrelated to this informa information package, I want to touch base with this evening and see what they have to say as well. Not only on this topic, but on other topics. So, I'm getting that ball rolling shortly. After this, I'm going to put on some shorts and climb on the roof of the man cave shop, and I'm going to hand paint the frickin' roof. <laughs> Why? Because then it'll probably cost, it'll be a lot cheaper to change the color of the roof in the shop by paint than it is by hand. I mean by buying new panels. That'll cost thousands. So that's what I'm going to do today. What else do I want to tell you guys? Um, quick off topic, you know, with all the shit going on the planet, and there's a lot of people, so many people say, um, you know, God's coming. God's coming soon. He's had enough. Things are getting so intense and so crazy that he's going to step in, and he's going to take care of everything. And I, how many people out there say that, share that, 
it's really overwhelming. I get an email to me nonstop. And um, for me, how do I say this? I, I mean, I definitely don't try to offend anyone. I never ever really say to everybody what I believe or don't believe. I listen to everybody no matter what and take from it what I will or leave it. But one thing I can share with all of you with confidence is, I mean, one of the first things that I felt when I climbed on top of a freaking ridiculously huge mountain in the middle of remote northern British Columbia in the Rocky Mountains where it's just no human beings forever. You climb, you climb on top of one, you stand on top of one of those mountains. And you do a 360. You look around. See how immense it is and how beautiful it is? It's amazing. And then what really kicks you in the guts is you instantly feel absolutely feeble. You feel absolutely insignificant and that you don't even count in any way. And you feel that you realize that this planet, this ball of dirt, whatever it is, has seen so much and been here so long. And myself is whatever I am, I am not even a half of a blink to my surroundings, to that mountain, to the earth I'm standing on. I am nothing. And that's that was one of the first stomach punches I got early in life when realizing just how immense and powerful and huge this place we call home is and how insignificant we are. We are nothing. Nothing. And uh, millions of us have come and gone. But the mountain I stand on is still the same. Absolutely beautiful. Who knows how long it actually really true, how old it really is. And uh, it just gives you a different perspective on life, right? What's going on? So, get back to what I was opening up with. You know, I actually Googled up because, you know, you think about how bad things are getting, but you got to think about how bad things have gotten for people not here in North America, but other places. And you got to wonder, well, how come, how come nobody rose up and saved their asses? Right, and that's going to be the simple answer. And listen to you guys. Don't be getting offended. This is open conversation, me being innocent, and I'm asking innocent questions that I am curious to get answers for. All right, because I get a lot of shit thrown at me, and people tell me that this is the way, and you better believe this, and you better accept this, or whatever, right? I'm like, okay, fair enough. But I got some questions. So here's an example. So back in World War II, six million Six million Jews were killed dead, and five million were imprisoned. That's a lot of people, man. That's a lot of prayers. That's a lot of people. That's very significant. At the same time, as an example, during that same time period, 24 million Russian people both civilian and military were killed. And this wasn't um, you know, lethal injection. This was deaths of horrific proportions that can only be described as absolute hell, right? The, the various ways of death, all these millions, millions of people experienced most horrific, disgusting, horrible, satanic, you, how do you even, I don't have the vocabulary to fully deliver it. You could, you cannot think up a worse scenario and it happened. But how come nobody rose up then? Hmm? That's an honest question. You know, imagine all those people, especially the Jews. I mean, they all lived in flourishing businesses, the most modern uptown communities. And systematically and, and rapidly, they, be, they started being attacked. The population started getting manipulated against them. They started getting spit on, kicked, and punched in the street. And the next six, you know, their businesses were ransacked, ruined, taken from them, their homes were taken from them. And then they told them to pack up their belongings. And they started marching them down the road, spitting at them, spitting on them, kicking them, punching them. And then they uh, marched them into those train cars, right? All their belongings went into one, and they went in the other. And off they went to go get killed. Now, that's, that's, I'm seeing that as an example of shit's getting bad. 
right? So just imagine, put yourself back there then, and you're looking at your family saying, shit's getting bad. Shit's getting bad here. Like this is getting really bad and I'm nervous. This is getting so bad, it's ridiculous. Now I wonder what it'd be like back then to be saying that and then have a handful of people say it's in God's hands. It's leaving God's hands. He's going to rise up and uh, he's going to make those bad people pay and he's going to put an end to this. Well, it didn't happen for them. And that was significant numbers and that was significant hell on earth, right? So, I'm not sure what I'm trying to say. Maybe I'm talking clear, maybe I'm not, but then I'm not denying the existence of God. I'm asking honest questions. So what I'm doing, and I'm giving examples of truth, of facts, of what has happened in our past as human beings. So what I'm saying is when I'm standing on that mountain, when I'm in those mountains nonstop on what is I consider the real world, which I've been given, um, I know that I don't count and I am nothing. And I will come and I will go and there isn't a stick or a brock or a tree around here that's going to miss my ass. It's just not. And I wonder if, what am I saying? I guess it's like the people that are dying right now, the shit sandwiches that are being dealt to all, the, all to every one of us, one after the other. Well, do we even count? Like, do we count? Hmm? Who's come to save our ass? If I look at the past history, past history of the world, nobody has come to save anybody's ass except for the people. From what I've seen so far, prove me wrong. Show me I'm wrong. Deliver me something to prove me that I'm wrong. But from what I can tell, it's choice. We all have a choice so far that I can see to make a difference. That I haven't seen anyone sit down on their ass and do and say nothing. But so-and-so's coming to save us. Just leave it in their hands. Because they haven't yet. Nobody has risen up and come to save anybody's ass yet in our history except for the people. Am I right or am I wrong? <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm right. So, um, the past examples of hell on earth have come and gone. Nobody rose up. No one from anywhere rose up that we weren't familiar with or never even saw before. They didn't. So... I don't know. I'm just at a, I'm not confused. Sometimes I'm, I, I just get a little, I get a lot thrown on my plate, a lot of thoughts, a lot of people are really chanting at me that it's in God's hands. He's coming. It's all scripture. End of times is here. The signs are here. Well, the signs were really here for those 30, 40 million people just a, you know, a couple of generations ago. The signs were really present then. Nobody could rose up and save their asses. Why not? I wonder why not, right? So, I guess I guess what I'm saying at the end of this ridiculous little rant that probably doesn't make any sense is it's up to you. From what I have learned so far and what I can see, it's up to you to make a difference. And nobody else, and there's no one else is going to save your ass but you. Right? And that starts with knowledge, and that starts with all the people realizing that they... they control the future and they own the power and to do the right thing and everybody's got the choice to do the right or the wrong thing right anyway babbling 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 i just hope that everybody chooses to do the right things shares knowledge speaks openly and realizes that it's up to you to stop the nonsense and the horseshit going down at any time it's up to you so there anyway I'm going to get rolling. That's a bit of a babble, wasn't it? I wonder if it even made sense. I'm going to post it anyway, but... Too bad I can... I wish I could take everybody. Everybody. One at a time. And stick your ass on top of a, a huge mountain on a blue bomber clear day in the middle of frickin' nowhere on the face of this planet. Just stand you there. Just stand you right over there by yourself. And <laughs> see how... Just see how important you feel you are then, right? Feel how significant you are, and then try to figure out who actually really truly cares about your ass on the face of that mountain right now, and who, what, what is gonna miss you right now if you disappeared? We're, we're, we, aren't, we aren't much when it comes to this planet. We aren't really that much. We're, we are a blink. We're gonna come, we're gonna go. 
Anyway, babble, babble, babble. Share knowledge with each other and stand up and fight against what is not right. Because <laughs> nobody else is going to. All right? Don't turn the other cheek. Try not to gaze at honest knowledge being passed on to you like a window, drooling window liquor, and then just walk away doing and thinking nothing. There's too many people doing that, and it's really upsetting. But there's nobody else is coming. Nobody's coming to help your ass but you and your community that you can create, right? Anyway, how's that for a babble? <laughs> Talk to you guys. Sure, I gotta go. I gotta get this body moving.